Okay, hi and welcome everyone. This is the second talk in the Easter term series of our Talking Animals Law and Philosophy series. Uh, my name is Raphael Fazel. For those of you who don't already know me, I'm the executive director of the Cambridge Centre for Animal Rights Law. Some of you may be attending the Talking Animals series for the first time, so I'm just going to say a few words about the format of how these events work. We will um, be able to listen to a presentation by our speaker that will last for about 30 to 45 minutes or so, and we'll then have another 40 minutes for Q&A and discussion afterwards. The event will end at around 6.30 p.m. UK time. Now, as always, you are all warmly invited to participate in the discussion. And in case you would like to ask a question or make a comment, um, could I please ask you to use either the chat function or the raise hand function, depending on which one you prefer. The chat function is on the bottom of your Zoom app and the raise hand function you'll find under the reactions button, the little smiley icon at the bottom of the Zoom app as well. Um, until that point, I'll be muting all the microphones. And also just to let you know, we are again recording this talk. So you can find the recording probably in a couple of days time on our website where you also find recordings of our other talks. Okay, with this out of the way, let me now introduce our speaker today. It is our great pleasure to have Professor Katie Sykes with us. Katie Sykes is Associate Professor in Law at Thompson Rivers University in Canada. She obtained a JD from the University of Toronto and after having clerked for Justice Louis LaBelle at the Supreme Court of Canada, she attended Harvard Law School for her LLM. In addition to obtaining another LLM from uh, Dalhousie University, she also completed her PhD at Dalhousie, uh, focusing on the relationship between international trade law and global animal law. Professor Sykes' main research area is animal law, but she also writes and researches on other topics such as innovation in law and the future of the legal profession. Her numerous publications in animal law include the recent monograph, Animal Welfare and International Trade Law, the impact of the WTO seal case, which is appearing this year with Edward Elgar. So do keep an eye out for that one um, in case you're interested in this topic. Professor Sykes has also co-edited the volume Canadian Perspectives on Animals and the Law, and she's published articles on topics such as cetacean captivity in Canada, animal welfare, wildlife and international trade law, as well as animal rights and environmental rights. In her presentation entitled International Law, General Principles and Animal Welfare, Professor Sykes will discuss some of that latest research with us today. So it's our great pleasure to have um, Professor Katie Sykes, and um, I'm going to hand over the hand over the virtual floor to you, Katie. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. That was uh, thanks for that lovely introduction, um, and thank you for inviting me. I'm really excited and honored to be part of this speaking series. It's uh, it's wonderful and I'm very proud to be involved in it. Um, thanks to everyone for coming and uh, good morning from Canada. <laughs> good morning if you're in anywhere near my time zone and good afternoon to the rest of you. Um, so I will plunge in. Um, I'm going to present to you on a chapter for a book that I'm working on and uh, Raphael and I just discovered that we're both working on chapters for the same book <laughs> so I'll kind of explain the context of that a little bit um, and I was uh, assured that it's okay to talk about works in progress and I assure you that this is very much a work in progress <laughs> so this builds a bit on some some research that I did a while ago but I am really just getting started so uh, number one, I hope you'll, you know, forgive me <laughs> if my knowledge is less than expert at this point. Um, and number two, I would really be delighted to have discussion um, from, from those who are watching because, you know, you may know more or be able to help me develop my ideas on this. Um, so the title is um, International Law, General Principles and Animal Welfare. Uh, oh, it's not moving for me. There we go. 
Um, and this is the sort of the background on the book project. Um, it is a big book, uh, the Handbook on Global Animal Law, that uh, I, sort of speaking on behalf of the editors, I think the idea, what they have in mind is to pull together sort of the, the state of the art right now in global animal law, international and transnational and comparative law concerning animals, which is a, an, an interesting area. It's kind of, um, I think, somewhat understudied. It's becoming more and more studied, but it's challenging because uh, international law is an area that kind of neglects animals. Um, so that's part of what I'll get into in the talk. Um, so we are all supposed to be writing our chapters kind of right now <laughs> for September. <laughs> and uh, I was probably not going to start on it uh, until August, but I had to do this presentation. <laughs> so, so I got moving. Um, and the editors are uh, Anna Peters, who is at the um, Max Planck Institute in Heidel Heidelberg. Kristen Stilt heads up the Animal Law and Policy Program at Harvard Law School. And Saskia Stuckey um, is also, I believe, at Max Planck and was a fellow um, visiting scholar at the, at the Harvard program, so it sort of bridges those two. Um, so these next bullets, the foundational and cutting edge issues, key principles, um, this is sort of the sections that the book is divided up into. So roughly it's covering um, a sort of broad array of legal concepts that are important in this field. Um, and then the impact of other disciplines. So how things like science and philosophy contribute to this field and specific reports on, on countries, um, religions and specific cases. Um, my chapter is, I'm just gonna move my little heads over. There we go. Um, animal protection as a general legal principle, rule of civilization, and or and or or de public. Um, the editors gave me this chapter, so they kind of like set up the the roadmap for me, um, and it goes into it belongs in the key concepts se uh, section of the book. So I believe the reason they asked me to do this, as uh, Raphael mentioned. I have done some research and published on general principles of international law and animal welfare a few years ago. Um, so part of the project here will be kind of building on that earlier work and then adding to it to incorporate those other concepts. Um, this is a reference to the article that I published uh, 10 years ago now um, on kind of looking at the, the possibility or the proposition that there could be a general principle of animal of international law concerning animal welfare. Um, and if none of that means anything to you, <laughs> I will go into sort of what that means a little bit at the beginning of my the, the, the substantive bit. Um, so the title, which as I noted here again, the editors gave me. Um, so full disclosure, when I started working on the chapter, I asked them, could I just make it general principles because that's easy or <laughs> easier because I already wrote about it. Um, and they're like, no, nope, we want you to uh, kind of expand the, the, uh, the thinking or the concepts to look at these other possible ideas. Um, so this is my marching orders. Uh, so part one, the title of the chapter refers to animal protection, not just animal welfare. Um, and that incorporates the idea that there, there is or could be or should be a principle that straddles the conservation of animal species and the, uh, the importance of protecting welfare of individual animals. Um, so kind of recognizing the ethical connections between those two things, which in international law, um, and I think probably in domestic law too, have been traditionally treated as being quite separate and not having much to say to one another. Um, and then these other concepts of a rule of civilization and ordre public, um, forgive my bad French pronunciation. Um, so those are uh, interesting concepts, especially civilization, which I think is a little bit of a kind of for 2021 years has something of an imperialist ring to it. Um, so I'll talk a bit more about that idea um, later. As I go through the presentation, it's also relevant to what general principles of international law are. Um, so this pretty much is my roadmap for the chapter and also for my talk to you today. Um, 
start with general principles and I want to sort of look at um, what I had looked at before and what's what's changed since then update um, and then integrate these other concepts you know going beyond welfare to look at animal protection um, and then these other ideas of rule of civilization or order of the bleak and uh, what kind of brings them together or what is the evolving thesis to make this into one coherent whole, which I hope will happen by the time I get to writing it. Um, so animal protection, as I mentioned, is this notion that you could have um, an integrated normative approach to the survival um, and the conservation of animal species and the individual well-being of animals that's based on sort of the intrinsic value of animals themselves. Um, general principles and rules of civilization and order public, you know, whatever they are, um, what, what those ideas, I think for me, all get at and have in common is that they, um, they're based on the idea that there could be not written or legislated rules or be going beyond written and legislated rules, but some form of sort of inchoate, fundamental, implicit norms that underpin the whole system. Um, that we kind of recognize as existing or acknowledge must exist for one reason or another, um, whether that be because you can't have a legal system that sort of really properly functions without them, or for uh, because they match up to um, inherent ethical obligations or our sense of what what is right and just and moral. Um, which of course is, you know, not a, a controversial idea, um, but that's going to be part of the idea that's presented here. Um, and they also have in common a sort of um, crossover between domestic and international law, so a um, cross fertilization, I think, between the domestic and the international. Um, and overall, uh, what I'm, what I hope to try to develop in this piece is a notion that. Um, would be somewhat of a corrective to the anthropocentric nature of international law. International law does not concern itself very much with animals, particularly with international animals. It's not that they're not there at all, but it's it, they're in small spaces and there's little recognition of them. And I think, you know, to put it in a, a rather oversimplified way, I think it would be better if it did. <laughs> and I think it's worthwhile sort of digging into international law to find the spaces where this may be recognized or you know could develop or um, would be kind of contenders for uh, for developing more animal focused norms so i'm going to zoom back a little bit and just talk about some very introductory notions about international law because i think they're just helpful for framing the discussion um, I had in mind that uh, the people who are in the audience here may come from different disciplinary backgrounds. Um, so I've sort of trying not to assume, you know, specialist knowledge or anything beyond kind of smart, interested people knowledge. Um, so for people who are international lawyers, this is probably quite boring because <laughs> it is very one on one, uh, but I thought it might be helpful. So international law is the, the law of rights and obligations between states, basically. Um, the sources of international law that are the, the that are sort of generally accepted as being the, the sources where it comes from are treaties, um, customary international law, which is based on state practice, what states do, plus a sense that that is done pursuant to a legal obligation to do so. Um, and then this category of general principles, which is what I'm going to be focusing on, uh, and I think is probably uh, a more neglected source and also like kind of the most mysterious source that's a lot of questions about what exactly they are. Um, the the next bullet about positivism and, and natural law. So what um, international lawyers and jurists think about kind of the nature of international law and what makes it law. Uh, I, I can, for me, usefully divide into this binary, and it's definitely an oversimplification. Um, I think that most people's thinking kind of partakes of both of these schools of thought, but it's kind of helpful to think of them um, 
as a binary. Positivism is just, just as it is for positivist approaches to domestic law, is the idea that law is law because because it exists, because it was made through some authoritative lawmaking process. And law, it, the law just is um, that which has been enacted or, or created as law. Um, so it doesn't involve an appeal to any sort of uh, thick or substantive notion of justice. Natural law, uh, which has like a, a lot of you know interesting writing and scholarship about it in international law, um, even though I would say that positivism is probably the dominant approach, um, but but there is very interesting sort of scholarship on natural law approaches to international law, and that really is based on the idea that there there are legal um, rights and obligations that exist because they're inherently just um, or sort of necessary, uh, and there can be legal rights or obligations that are that sort of formally properly enacted but aren't really law because they don't match up to that nature of international laws being sort of reflecting justice, substantive justice. So state consent is very important in the positivist approach. It's really sort of the basis of the bindingness of international law. States are bound by that which they signed up to through treaties, for example. Um, and in the, in, in the natural law approach, it is less crucial. Um, so a natural law-based norm like human rights from from a natural law point of view would be binding on all states whether or not they explicitly signed up to it depending on the nature of the norm um, another sort of useful thing to think about is the shift from a completely state-centric model to one that looks at other um, sort of actors or entities in the, the international legal system a little more um, so our modern system of international law, so what we know as international law today, really developed along with the emergence of the modern nation state um, following the Peace, to, Peace of Westphalia in the 17th century. Um, and for most of that history, it has been more or less exclusively concerned with states, with the, the rights and obligations that states owe to one another. Um, that has certainly changed in the 20th century. Um, I think you could debate how much it's changed. It's still, it, states are still really important, um, but the individual has emerged as, the individual human being <laughs> has emerged as an important actor in this system. And I put in a quotation there from a recent case for, uh, from the Supreme Court of Canada, uh, which goes over this history and describes it as a, a very fundamental sort of like 180 change. Um, I think maybe they exaggerate a little bit how much it's changed, but the, 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 there's been a paradigm shift from the state-centric model to um, the integral importance of the individual that is the result of mainly the emergence of international human rights law following the Second World War. And this case concerned um, a claim, uh, an attempt by uh, individuals, to, individual plaintiffs, to claim that there was a domestic tort based on the violation of a norm of customary international law by a private company. So private actors on both sides in the domestic legal arena, but the basis of the sort of legal obligation was customary international law violation of human rights. Um, and there are cases like that popping up. I know there's a couple in the UK um, that are also this was a, a the defendant was an extractive industry and mining company um so that's an area where where these kinds of theories are are being developed more um and in the nevson case the supreme court said yes that is possible they didn't say that it actually exists but they said it's possible that it exists and then the case settled so we still don't know whether it actually exists um so that's kind of an illustration of the increased importance of the individual. An individual can actually sort of claim a right based on international law, potentially, um, and exercise that right against a private actor in, in a domestic arena. Um, the environment and the natural world also uh, have increasing importance and weight in the international legal system um, since roughly about the 1970s. So there is this large body of international environmental law that to some extent recognizes um, that these, these entities are part of the international legal system too. Um, but for animals, there is very little, except 
um, to the extent that they're part of the environment or biological diversity that has some protection. Um, but the, the animal as individual is not completely absent, but like pretty close to absent. There's a, there's a marked contrast between the extent to which there's law about um, biological diversity in species um, and any kind of mention of individual animal welfare, well-being, or value in international law. So um, I'm going to turn now to this idea of general principles, um, and then I'll talk about the possibility that there could be a general principle concerning animal welfare. So there are those three sources of law that I mentioned, um, treaties, custom, and general principles. How do we know they're the sources? Well, mostly because there is a statute that creates the International Court of Justice, um, and there was a predecessor statute that created its predecessor, the, the Permanent Court of International Justice, um, which has the same language, and it lists the sources that the court can apply to disputes between nations. Um, so Article 30, 38.1a and b are treaties and custom, and then we have um, subsection c, the general principles of law recognized by civilized nations. Um, and that is word for word the same as was in the predecessor statute. So this language comes from the early 20th century, um, can be traced back to sort of late 19th century. It reflects its time. If we were writing down a description of what general principles are today, I don't think we'd use the word civilized, civilized nations um, because it has this connotation of sort of uh, Western centric um, kind of imperialist uh, civilizing mission type approach to international law. Um, and that's that's pretty outdated, right? We don't really talk about what nations are civilized and what nations are not civilized anymore. Um, and it may be that language may be one of the reasons that general principles have been a little bit of a neglected source and there's been a lot more um, action and attention paid to the other two. Um, I think there's a certain discomfort <laughs> with this sort of um, connotation of these old fashioned ideas of a hierarchy of nations. Um, however, more recently, um, judges and scholars have interpreted the idea of civilized nations not as kind of dividing like the good nations and the bad nations or the ones that are sort of like advanced and not advanced but as a an allusion to this idea that there are certain values um, or principles of justice that are are, are the mark of civilization or um, perhaps being not conducting ourselves ethically um, so for example, um, recognition of principles like human rights is is a civilized thing to do, right? and that that uh, sort of would support the idea that those are principles recognized by civilized nations. Um, that's very much a natural law idea, and for to me, the most interesting work on general principles and the work that offers the most promise, or the thinking that offers the most promise for finding room for animals is in this idea that um, general principles have, have a sort of a natural law component to them. Um, I'm, there's a few examples on the next two slides of things that have appear to be maybe recognized as general principles of international law. Um, I won't dwell on these ones too much. These are earlier ones. And uh, they're kind of a bit less interesting to me, but uh, and there are of course many other many other examples. I didn't attempt to be exhaustive because it would have been very boring. Um, but these ones will give you sort of a sense of uh, in the this this kind of time period, so sort of like mid to late twentieth century, um, the things that the court sort of was willing to look at or discuss in the kind of language that. Um, it suggests that they may be general principles. This is the International Court of Justice that I'm referring to. So trusteeship, um, essentially the sort of like um, the, the structure of a trust where one person handles property or the interests of, of another person on their behalf. If the um, person who uh, is like the beneficiary of that relationship is under some sort of disability or unable to do it for themselves, that was recognized as being a feature of nearly every legal system. Um, the 
the notion of um, separate legal personality for corporations and shareholders, limited corporate liability, that's another one from Barcelona Traction, um, estoppel uh, from this, the, the case in the last bullet there. Um, some others that have been discussed are things like um, res judicata, right? Like not getting another kick at the can, um, joint and several liability. So kind of procedural-ish norms and kind of um, things that might be familiar from private law disputes. Um, so now this is the more interesting stuff to me. These two judges of the, who were judges on the, well, one was a judge on the International Court of Justice and one still is, um, have written very, very interesting examinations of the notion of general principles. Um, so the first one, Judge we Weeramantri, they're both judges from the developing world, um, and he was a Sri Lankan judge. I'm not even going to try to say that Hungarian stuff. <laughs> I, I don't think that I can pronounce that right. Gap Chikovo Najimaros? I don't know. <laughs> this is, international law is like the biggest challenge is saying stuff right. Um, so this case, um, in, in Judge Weeramantri's separate opinion, he said that sustainable sustainable development is a general principle of international law um, on the basis of a really, really interesting and detailed discussion of what general principles are. Um, it's a sort of like multicultural positive notion of um, civilized nations uh, and looks at, you know, lots of history of different cultures all around the world, indigenous cultures. Um, and for him, the, the concept of general principles, this is a concept that incorporates natural law ideas, right? So inescapable logical necessity of the principle. It is just, you know, it's just a, it's just right. It's just a thing that, that we should recognize. Um, and its presence of a, an idea like this, an idea of balancing um, sort of economic um, progress with protection of the natural world, uh, he sees that basic idea recurring over and over again in the world's civilizations and legal traditions. So that also touches on one of the things about general principles is that they have um, a sort of double character that they may emanate from or be found in the e international legal system itself, um, or they can also be part of legal the international legal system because they got there by being present in all the domestic legal systems or almost all and that's one of the things that's unclear it's like does it have to be universal or if it's kind of um, predominant enough in enough domestic legal systems is that enough to ground a general principle um, I don't think anyone really knows because <laughs> it is a little bit under underdeveloped as a, a as a sort of the examination of this source um, and then the second one, which is also like just a fantastically interesting opinion on general principles for anyone who's interested in this, is from the Pulp Mills on the River Uruguay case from 2010. Um, and the judge, uh, Judge Cansado Trindade is a Brazilian judge, was a judge on the Inter-American Court of Human Rights and is unapologetically and robustly pro natural law in international law um, and sees the um, the category of general principles as being natural law based. Um, he refers here to general principles being based on conscience from coming from the un universal juridical conscience. Um, in that case, he looks in, it's, it's, a, it's a good read, um, looks into some of the drafting history of the ICJ st statute, the PCIJ statute, um, and there was there was um, haggling over the inclusion of this language on general principles, uh, partly because some of the drafters didn't like the sort of possibility of letting in these non-positivist natural law ideas. Um, and there's that there, there's a quotation from one of the people involved in this discussion at the time, it's contemporary, about pr general principles being those that are engraved on people's hearts. So I think you can probably see why I find this an interesting area to sort of potentially dig into to find room for animals. Um, in that case, Judge Cansado Trindade said, um, in international environmental law, pre prevention and the precautionary principle are both general principles of international law. Um, so what about animals? 
10 years ago, 11 years ago, um, the authors of the second edition of Lister's International Wildlife Law proposed that, argued that there may be a general principle of international law concerning animal welfare that has established itself. Um, so this is the quotation, given the pervasiveness of international concern for animal welfare and the wealth of recent formal expressions of commitment to that objective, it may now be plausible to discern a convergence on a general principle of law to that effect in the sense of the ICJ statute. Um, so I don't think anyone had ever argued that before, and it was sort of sort of a bold <laughs> argument, especially considering how neglected animals are in international law. Um, but a really interesting um, thought-provoking place to look for space for animals, because it is the case that, first of all, all around the world, um, domestic legal systems have pay some attention to animal welfare. And secondly, that there's, there is, although still in a limited way, more and more attention to, or sort of um, acknowledgement of the, uh, uh, in the international arena, the, the idea that animal welfare at least is important and worth paying attention to. Um, so a little, I'm going to break down a little bit uh, their argument about a general principle concerning animal welfare and then talk about sort of what happened since then. So the, the argument of, I, I'm going to just say Bowman, because <laughs> I'm going to guess it was Michael Bowman who wrote this part. Uh, this is something that he has written on extensively. So I'm going to, you know, be a little unfair to the other th two authors and say he probably held the pen for this, <laughs> this part of the book. Um, why general principles? Why is this a promising place to look? Um, animal welfare does tend to be a thing that is mostly regulated at the domestic level. There are some areas of human activity, like transportation of animals, for example, um, where there are sort of international implications. Um, but it that that's a relatively small part of activity concerning animals, and it's it's mainly a domestic matter. Um, treaties and customary international law are very much about the obligations that states owe to one another. Not entirely, because things like human rights do also tend to um, be about you know uh, states have obligations to observe human rights with respect to their own residents and nationals. Um, and then this sort of added on um, international obligation, but they're not the most obvious place other than when it comes to activities that are international in nature to look for um, international rights and obligations. But general principles by their nature are this sort of crossover place between domestic and international. Um, and so they may be a place where considerations about animal welfare that are recognized in domestic systems have become established in the international legal order. The evidence that Bowman and the others <laughs> looked at um, to argue that there is a general principle um, on the international side is various places and treaties. We don't have an international treaty about animal welfare, that doesn't exist. But there are lots of other treaties that have to do with animals um, as part of the environment. Uh, there's also trade treaties so that since this time, the European Union has included animal welfare language in many of its trade treaties. Um, but they looked at uh, environmental treaties many of which have somewhere in there <laughs> kind of in some like clause or a preambulatory language or something some reference to the intrinsic value of animals um, human obligations to, to towards animals and um, humane principles so in CITES um, a treaty on trade and endangered species uh, there, there are rules about um, how you transport live specimens if you are trading, if you are moving animals across borders. Um, and if they're animals, there, there are rules about transporting them humanely so that they don't suffer during transportation. Um, and it's actually like a pretty extensive set of rules. Um, so it's an environmental treaty, it's for protecting endangered species, but it's got this whole mechanism for protecting the welfare of the individual animals as well. Um, only when they're being transported, there was at one time um, an attempt to get 
CITES to cover um, humane collection of specimens, and it just didn't work because it wasn't it wasn't really part of what the treaty is about. Um, in the international whaling regime, and these are just two examples. The the book does go through a bunch of, of different examples, but I think these are probably good representatives and two of the most important ones. So the international whaling regime started out as not, not even a conservation regime. It was a sort of sharing, sharing an international resource um, regime. It sort of developed um, or evolved into being more focused on, you know, let's not kill all the whales so that there's none left. Um, and it has come to reflect, I think, the international community's ethical and moral convictions about what is okay to do to whales, um, including having rules about humane killing methods, and then starting in the 1980s, actually no commercial hunting at all. And that does go beyond um, conservation because the moratorium on whaling applies, you know, regardless of whether the species is in trouble. Um, so it reflects a kind of mixed concern about conservation and concern about it kind of just being wrong. <laughs> Some Many nations are just simply opposed to commercial hunting of whales. Um, so that's on the international side. And then um, animal welfare is reflected in many, I think, almost all domestic legal systems have some sort of rules concerning um, prohibition on the infliction of unnecessary suffering or like guarding against animal cruelty and the world's religious traditions this is a common theme in, in them as well um, so bowman and the others argued that 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 may be enough evidence that this is one of those pristine and universal values that command international recognition using the language of justice remarantry from that case um, with the difficult name <laughs> <laughs> that was about pollution. No, oh, dams. Um, so that's the evidence that perhaps there could be a general principle. Um, if there is, what is it? What's the, what's the content of that principle? So Bowman proposes that it's, it's a procedural rather than a substantive principle, um, that the obligation or the, the responsibility internationally would be that national decisions that have some effect um, or impact on animal welfare would be subject to some kind of international institutional review um, where, while the domestic governments would ultimately have the discretion about how to implement the, the principle about animal welfare in practice, but some kind of, you know, justification for a check at the international level on your, you are doing something that has a dramatic effect or, or an important effect on animal welfare, and um, it's out of keeping with these, with this international norm. Um, so that kind of covers in a rather summary fashion, what the arguments were that um, Bowman et al. put forward a decade ago. What has changed since then? Two important themes. One is that there's been a lot more written about general principles of international law since then. Um, it was kind of the neglected source of the three. Um, I think it kind of still is the neglected source of the three, but there's, there is far more material on it. Um, I think partly um, one, I don't know if it's one of the causal factors or if it's a result of more attention being paid or maybe maybe both, um, but it is on the program of the International Law Commission. Um, so this work is carrying on, it's in progress. Um, the commission is looking into the nature of general principles and there are two um, extensive reports by a special rapporteur from 2019 and 2020. Um, there is a lot of scholarship when like, I started kind of looking into this, uh, there's clearly been an uptick in scholarship on general principles. And one of the most useful for me is this book that just came out um, this year. And this really has been like a goldmine <laughs> for me for sort of going through like what the, what the current state of the art is on general principles. Um, what about this? notion of animal welfare or animal protection as a general principle. Um, there have been developments uh, internationally, and I think domestically, I, it, looking at the domestic developments, of course, to do it properly would be would 
required doing sort of a comprehensive survey and uh, have not done that <laughs> and I'm not going to do that um, but I think we I, I think it is right to say that in the last 10 years animal welfare has sort of moved up on the agenda for, for lawmakers. And I, there's a couple of examples that I'll talk about. But at the international level, um, I think easily the most important development is that an international tribunal actually talked about animal welfare for the first time. And that is in the WTO seal products decision. Um, this was a dispute over the European Union's decision to ban trade in seal products. And it was Canada, my uh, adoptive country, that challenged that, and also Norway, because um, Canada has one of the world's biggest seal hunts. Not, not something that I'm super proud of, but there it is. Um, and the European Union's ban, essentially the WTO uh, upheld it and said, yes, you are allowed to have this ban with some modification. Um, but it was actually modification that was more protective of animal welfare rather than less. So it's the first time that the WTO considered whether ethical concerns about animal welfare can be a justification for restrictive trade measures. Um, and it, it definitely can, there's no question about that anymore. Um, there is a public morals exception in WTO law and animal welfare was recognized as being um, something that can be an aspect of public morals. It's not automatically an aspect of public morals, but if in the society, the state that is invoking this exception, it, it is something that the public is morally concerned about, then that can be a basis for justifying limits on trade. So that's really important because um, in trade law, uh, there, there, have, there were concerns that it wouldn't that there wasn't enough room to sort of limit or regulate trade based on animal welfare concerns. And it, it is clear under WTO law that that is something you can do. Um, the panel decision came out in 2013 and the appellate body decision came out the year after. The panel said this language about animal welfare, that it's an ethical responsibility for human beings in general and a globally recognized issue, um, which sounds like a little bit like a general principle, right? Um, they did not say it's a general principle. And I don't think a WTO panel or the appellate body would want to wade into saying whether something is um, a general principle in general international law. I don't think they see that as their sort of institutional mandate. Um, but the language gestures towards the same ideas that underlie general principles. Um, the appellate body uh, changed, so overturned some of the panel's holdings, but not this. So it remains, uh, I would say, as an authoritative part of the WTO decision on this matter. Um, so it's, you know, that's a big deal for animal law people because there's so little in international law that actually directly engages with animals as individuals that have welfare and suffering. Um, and it's really the first time that an international tribunal has said anything about it um, and identified it as something in international law. It's a globally recognized issue. It is an ethical responsibility. That to me sounds like it is a norm. It has some sort of normative um, weight and maybe a general principle, or it could, I think, be taken as evidence supporting this idea that it's a general principle. Um, another decision that was important sort of on the animal front and that I see as some, something of a missed opportunity, not surprisingly, um, but a place where the International Court of Justice, you know, could have said something about the intrinsic value of animals about animal protection and very deliberately avoided doing so um, is the whaling in the Antarctic case from 2014. Um, so this was concerning the legality of Japan's scientific whaling program um, under an exception to the moratorium on whale hunting. Um, and the the language that permits this the Japan to invoke this recept, this exception is for the purposes of scientific research. So the International Court of Justice found that Japan's program didn't fit into that language. Um, the, it was challenged on the basis that basically they were just doing commercial whaling and sort of slapping the label scientific research on it. Um, the decision turns on very a very narrow and technical interpretation of what for the purposes of scientific research means. Um, it does not, 
very deliberately and consciously does not get into the sort of raging fights about the ethics of whaling. Um, and the, the court pretty much says, you know, it, it doesn't, that there are some kind of requirements for this to fit into being for the purposes of scientific research, there's a sort of pr proportionality requirement. And it's definitely possible to design a program without making too many changes that fits into it, which is exactly what Japan did. They just kind of made a few tweaks and then continued pretty much exactly as, as before. So it's, um, I think, you know, not surprising, but a little disappointing for animal people that there really is kind of no um, engagement with the, the bigger, deeper ethical questions about the status of whales and animals more generally and human relationship with them, what is, you know, right to do. Um, but Judge Cansado Trindade, who you recognized from a couple of slides ago, wrote a separate opinion um, and did get more into a, a teleological approach, a pro an approach based on the purpose of the international whaling regime, um, and said that it's it's about protecting whales and the exception should not be used in a way that is contrary to that purpose. Um, so I kind of like that opinion, um, but it doesn't really stand for what the whole court thinks. Um, I mentioned I would talk about a couple of examples in domestic law, and this really is a completely arbitrary ad hoc choice based largely on the fact that uh, the UK is actually where I was born. <laughs> so my original home country is doing some stuff and my current country where I live is doing some stuff. So, and they're interesting. So I will throw those in. One thing I wanna say about general principles of international law and um, domestic legal systems is that you know being realistic and and uh, sort of not deceiving myself about this? Um, something that is common to all of the world's legal systems is that we exploit and abuse animals, and we don't give them enough protection. And I think that that has to be recognized in assessing or evaluating um, the possibility of a general principle that you know there may be lip service paid to these things, but there is no country that adequately protects animal protection, even the ones that, or sorry, animal welfare, um, even the ones that are relatively advanced and get sort of like the top marks in the World Animal Protection Report. You know, the situation for animals um, is well, especially domestic animals, but also wild animals, is desperate. Um, so. Maybe there's a general principle, but I think we have to be realistic about how well it works or how much it achieves. Um, but flipping to the somewhat more optimistic side, um, I think probably the people in this audience will be aware the UK just introduced a new proposed um, animal welfare sentience bill. Uh, that is to fill a gap that exists because of Brexit. Um, the Treaty on the Functioning of the European Union recognizes that animals are sentient beings. So when Britain, when the, when the UK exited, um, there wasn't anything in domestic law that recognized that, even though I think it is very much something that um, the, the UK society recognizes and uh, holds as a value. So new legislation has been introduced to um, to recognize this, the status of animals as sentient beings. And it would create an animal sentience committee that can advise the government on whether proposed action would have an adverse effect on the welfare of animals as sentient beings. So I think that's really interesting. I have not seen anything quite like that before. I have sort of wished that something like that existed um, for a long time. And for me, it sort of resonates with the idea of Bowman that at the international level, animal welfare could be a, a procedural principle, um, something that is a basis for some form of procedural review. Um, this might be, you could imagine this, or I could imagine this being a model for a kind of um, advisory body at the international level that would have some authority to advise um, international actors and states on the impact of actions, proposed actions on animal welfare. Um, and so here is the example from Canada to uh, flesh out our two country survey of domestic systems. Um, we have new proposed legislation that was introduced by um, former Senator Murray Sinclair, 
who retired, I think the same day that he introduced this or shortly after. Um, and he is an indigenous senator, was an indigenous senator. He's still, he's still, he's still indigenous. He's just not a senator anymore. Um, it's a private member's bill introduced in the Senate called the Jane Goodall Act. Uh, it probably won't pass because it's a private member's bill, but you never know. It happens sometimes. Um, it, it's always very interesting sort of seeing what, what the fate is of animal protective legislation in our system. Um, and I, who knows what will happen, but I wouldn't be surprised if some of the ideas or the concepts of this, even if the bill doesn't pass, kind of get picked up in the future and worked into other legislation. Um, so it's it's fairly um, progressive and bold on animal protection. It would ban captivity of great apes, elephants, and potentially other wild animals. It sort of provides for there to be regulations that specify other animals. Um, there is an exception to that ban on captivity um, where it's in the best interests of the animal. So that would be for sort of rehabilitation of an injured animal, that kind of thing. Um, and the requirement there is it must be in the best interest with regard to individual welfare and the conservation of the species. Um, so it puts those two ideas together and they're both requirements. Um, the preamble refers to indigenous understanding that all life forms of creation are interconnected and interdependent. It also has really interesting provisions about um, potential representation of animals in proceedings. Um, so that's, you know, plants a lot of really interesting and fruitful ideas who knows if they will they'll go anywhere um and as i mentioned when i was starting out in this the, the reality is i mean this is this is great i i love the jane goodall bill i'm really sort of excited that this got introduced um our real actual existing animal law is terrible in this country um and you know it's it's better in the uk and it will be great if you have this animal animal sentience committee but um, you know, I saw a stat this morning on Twitter, 70% of the um, farmed animals in the UK are in factory farming intensive systems. In the US, it's 99%. So the reality is, you know, grim. Um, but there is, there is this evidence that lawmakers and legal systems are at least taking animal welfare more seriously. The changes are incremental and small. And we in animal law, you, you just sort of have to accept that. <laughs> That's kind of like all there is and try to make the most of what there is. Um, so I mentioned one of the things that's sort of an add-on or, or a new challenge for me in this chapter is to look at animal protection, not just animal welfare. Um, it is being used more and more, and I mean, I myself use it as a, as a shorthand for, a, for capturing the idea that survival of animal species and well-being of individual animals um, need to be looked at together and are connected. They're not completely distinct concerns. They are sometimes in tension, um, but it kind of depends on what the values are that underline it, like why is conservation important? Um, if it's important just because we want to, you know, have whales so that we can keep killing them, then they are distinct and in opposition with one another. But if it's important because animals matter, then there is a relationship between them. Um, so Bowman and his co-authors really brought out this idea by having a chapter in a book about international wildlife law, which is almost entirely conservation law on animal welfare. Um, they found animal welfare in the context of international wildlife law. Um, more recently, other scholars have been writing about sort of connecting the ethical grounding of envir environmental law and animal welfare more. So Werner Schultz is, I think, one of the best scholars and writers on this. Um, and he has advocated for, you know, really a sea change in environmental law to be more ethically grounded. Um, and shifting towards a welfare centric ethic. Um, Joan Schaffner, these quotations actually both come from chapters in the same book, and I can tell people what that is uh, if you're interested. Um, so she uh, argues for a paradigm shift towards a non anthropocentric ethic um, where the law protects the well being of individual wild animals for their own interest. So, not just because we humans want to use them, not just because we like a world where 
elephants and rhinoceroses still exist, but because they are important for themselves. Um, and again, I recall that language from our draft, our potential Jane Goodall Act, um, that puts individual welfare and conservation of the species together um, as a double requirement for the best interests of, of, of the animal. Um, I'm now going to move on to the rule of civilization idea. Um, and just, you know, to, to recap, I think that this, this notion um, also alludes to or connotes the idea that there is a sort of um, a sort of necessity or a sort of inherent um, ethical weight of certain principles, um, arguably including the protection of animals, that is based on the idea of sort of just like acting civilized um, with, of course, recognizing all the baggage that comes along with that term. So rule of civilization, where did that come from? Um, it came from uh, Anna Peters, who said, I want you to write your chapter about this. Um, and it came from uh, via her from a couple of Canadian judges who have referred to um, non, not inflicting the obligation not to inflict unnecessary suffering on animals, um, which is, of course, part of our domestic law, as it is in most countries, as being based on some notion of this is this is civilized behavior. So I'll start with there's an old case and a more recent case. I'll start with the more recent case, Reese versus the city of Edmonton. Um, this is really the most important decision, judicial decision concerning animals and Canadian law. Um, and it is, um, I mentioned that in animal law, you know, we have to be kind of content with the crumbs from the table and the like little bits of progress. This is certainly an example of, of that. This is a case where uh, the people who were trying to advocate for an animal lost at every stage, um, but there's a dissent and it's got some cool stuff in it. Uh, so the animal in question is Lucy, an elephant who is at a zoo in Edmonton. Um, Edmonton, for anyone who doesn't know, is really cold. Not a great place for an elephant to live. Um, that photo actually isn't Lucy. I do have photos of her, but they're not. The resolution isn't as good. Um, and she is, her life is tough. She lives on her own. Um, being a female elephant alone with no one to socialize is just not how elephants want to be. Um, she doesn't get to move around enough. Uh, she has had like persistent foot problems and overweight and a lot of a lot of health problems. Um, there's been a campaign to have Lucy released to a sanctuary that's been going on for probably about 20 years at this point. Um, and these campaigns have worked in other places. For example, the Toronto Zoo had three elephants and let them go to a sanctuary in California a few years ago. Um, the Edmonton Zoo has always, the, the Edmonton Valley Zoo in the city that runs the zoo has always resisted that. Um, now their argument is her health is, is so poor that it would put her health at risk to move her. Um, but I think, you know, part of the reason is they like having an elephant. She's, she's an attraction. Um, so the people who were trying to get Lucy out of the zoo have tried all sorts of different tactics. And one of them was to go to court um, and ask the court to issue a declaration that the city which operates the zoo was not complying with provincial animal welfare law, um, which prohibits um, inflicting unnecessary suffering. And they said that her life inherently is unnecessary suffering. She can't live in the zoo um, without it being suffering for her. Uh, and that was dismissed by the lower court, the Court of Queen's Bench as an abusive process, um, and the Alberta Court of Appeal upheld that decision. Uh, but this is the good bit. The Chief Justice of Alberta wrote a dissenting opinion. Um, it is, there is nothing like this in Canadian jurisprudence. It's an extended examination of um, the sort of philosophical bases of animal welfare, its status in Canadian law, um, the dissent is, I think, about five times longer than the actual decision. Um, it's, it, it's, it's a good one. It's fun to read. It, it's, it didn't help Lucy, but it, it helped the uh, development of Canadian animal law. Um, and Justice Fraser refers to the prohibition of cruelty to animals being so ingrained in our society that it is considered a rule of civilization. 
um, which suggests that it is sort of an inherent value of civilized societies, and also that it is something of a universal value, that it is not specific to our society, but to all civilized societies. Um, Justice Fraser drew that language, the rule of civilization, from an earlier case, which is also a very important Canadian animal law case. We don't have very many, um, and those two are probably the top two. Uh, and this was a decision from 1978 from the Quebec Court of Appeal, um, interpreting the criminal code offense of causing unnecessary pain, suffering, or injury to an animal, which is pretty much the same offense we still have in the criminal code today. Um, the facts, I won't go again into much because they're like quite upsetting, but um, perhaps useful for context. It concerned um, the method of euthanasia for stray dogs. And there was a method that, that the uh, that the defendant was using um, that caused some suffering, and there was there was another way to do it that was available, but somewhat more expensive. Um, so that's a that's an unusual set of facts for a criminal animal cruelty conviction. Um, and yet, the Quebec Court of Appeal said, you know, if you can do it a, a less painful way, then it is unnecessary suffering to do it this way. Um, I would say that our su subsequent jurisprudence on um, unnecessary suffering has departed from that somewhat, um, but it, it set out, this case set out this idea of a sort of balancing test, that you have a purpose and you have means of achieving that purpose, and you really have to have some sort of pr proportionality between um, the amount of suffering that's inflicted and the purpose, and some attention to whether there is a less painful alternative. Um, one of the reasons that a decision is important is that the judge who wrote it, it was then at the court of the Quebec Court of Appeal, later went to the Supreme Court of Canada and became the Chief Justice of Canada. Um, so Justice Lemaire refers to the legislation reflecting a policy um, and this is very interesting and very 1970s language, um, to recognize the protection of animals in accordance with their subordinate status and our responsibilities as their masters. Um, and he says, you know, we can hurt them, we can exploit them, we can use them because we're their masters and their subordinate, but we can't just do anything. We renounce, we do not renounce the right given um, to us by virtue of uh, our position as supreme creatures, which really makes me laugh because I do not think of myself as a supreme creature, um, to put animals at our service. But humans impose on themselves a rule of civilization by which they renounce, condemn, and repress animal cruelty, the infliction of unnecessary suffering. Um, so my last one, and as I mentioned, this is like beginning, beginning stages for me. So um, rule of civilization, that's really interesting, seems to connect with general principles in a way, but I'm, you know, I have not worked through all the thinking about that yet. Uh, and the last one is this concept of order public, which is the, the least familiar for me. Um, I think this is probably a more well-known concept in civil law systems, and I'm very much from a common law background. Um, and it, it, it is something that has a presence in domestic and international law. Um, the concept of order public in English usually translated as public policy. Um, and it is something like these principles that are sort of un underlying the whole legal system and shared by the whole society. Um, in private international law, it can be invoked as an exception uh, for saying, that the, a foreign law can't apply when it would otherwise apply because it is contrary to order public in the sort of receiving state. Um, in international intellectual property law in statutes, there's uh, in treaties rather, um, there's recognition that, so international IP law provides for sort of like reciprocal recognition of protections, um, but a state can refuse to grant a patent, sort of recognizing a patent that has been granted in another state if it's contrary to order public or sort of principles of like public morals in that state that is being asked to give the, the patent. Um, and the Supreme Court of Canada has interpreted that as meaning the protection of public security, the physical integrity of individuals as members of society and the protection of the environment. So interestingly, interestingly the context for saying that was um, the Supreme Court of Canada's consideration of a challenge to the validity of a patent on a mouse. Um, it's called known as the Harvard mouse case. 
Um, and it was a, a, a genetically modified onco mouse, which is a mouse that is specifically bred to be um, susceptible to growing cancer tumors very quickly so that research on cancer can be done faster and more efficiently on them. And the Supreme Court um, upheld the patent in that case. So they said, yeah, there is this order publique exception where um, countries can decide not to grant a patent that exists in another country if it is um, contrary to their or doesn't fit in with their domestic values. But the Canadian statute um, does not have an order publique exception. So if the requirements, the sort of formal requirements for poor validity are met, then there's no basis to say, we just think this is creepy um, to patent this mouse. <laughs> and so therefore the patent was upheld. Um, a couple of other notes on order publique in sort of interesting contexts. One is that the uh, the principle of order publique may be a principle of a general principle of international law. There is a, this decision from 1958 where two of the judges in separate opinions um, wrote language that indicated this kind of idea of like universal recognition or presence in all the domestic legal systems. Um, and Another context where this comes up in a sort of interesting way that intersects with animals is the human rights cases on hunt, hunting um, associations and private landowners who object to hunting. Um, so private landowners who don't want hunting going on on their ground, uh, on their land, in these cases have due to the operation of domestic law that creates these sort of like hunting associations and rights um, been required to allow hunters to come onto their land and hunt um, and have successfully challenged that under European human rights law a number of times in slightly different factual configurations. Um, so there is a right to manifest one's individual beliefs um, as well as private property rights. There, it is permissible um, under the convention to have limits on those rights, the right to manifest one's belief beliefs on the basis of public order. Um, and public order was invoked as the reason for having these local laws about hunting. So for example, to, so to control the wild animal population in the, in the area. Um, but it, it didn't work to justify interference with the individual rights in those cases. Um, perhaps because, I mean, I'm extrapolating here, but I think an argument could be made that if animal welfare or the protection of animals is part of public order or is a sort of component of public order itself, that sort of undermines the extent to which a, a state can rely on public order um, to limit the, the rights of someone who is asserting the value of animals. Um, so to sum it up, um, it's, it's a little bit of a kind of depressing <laughs> summing up, um, because I, I do think that international law is severely lacking in attention to the intrinsic value of animals and to the importance of animal protection and um, really creating a framework for a relationship between humans and animals that is based on something other than exploitation. Uh, but I do think it's possible that there could be room for it. And I think that it's worth sort of thinking about and doing the work to try to develop that. Um, and to me, this idea of unwritten fundamental principles, um, principles that have obligatory power because they are consistent with our ethical sense or our conscience um, is probably the best place to look for it. I, it just seems unlikely to me that, um, you know, the United Nations is going to get together and draft a treaty about animal protection and animal welfare anytime soon. Um, but there are these kind of expressions of commitment to the idea that animals are important, that something could be built from. Um, reality does not match up to those ideals, and that is just a fact. Um, but Michael Bowman has argued, and I agree with this, you don't stop there, right? Part of the whole, the point of having international law and international decision makers is that that system is um, they are the guardians and guarantors of civilized behavior. There's that word again. Um, and courts and tribunals have, have the ability to say, to uh, hold states up to those principles and say, when you are acting in a way that is um, not civilized with respect to animals, you know, we can say something about it. 
Um, and I think we really do need to think hard about this in, in the international arena because our relationship with animals and nature is broken and dysfunctional and it is at a global level and there's, there's some need for a global solution. Um, I'm going to finish with a quotation from Michael Bowman, who is really just a tremendous writer on these issues. I, his, his work is incredible and inspiring. Um, and it's a depressing <laughs> quote, uh, but, I, but it underlines the importance or the relevance, I think, of these considerations to the international legal order. Um, so Bowman says, the non-recognition and neglect of the moral status of all the other species that inhabit this earth has taken decades merely to begin to correct, resulting in an extinction crisis that rivals the most catastrophic events in the evolutionary history of our planet, and now threatens our own ex existential security, along with that of innumerable other biological taxa. Um, something actually that kind of extends to plants as well as animals, but when it comes to animals, um, you know, the ethical significance of animals is very much bound up with not only their value as sort of con continuing to exist, but also the fact that they can um, they can suffer and they can have well-being, and that is ethically important. Um, so that's it for my quick overview of my chapter, and I would absolutely love to have uh, questions and suggestions.